a day or the week after Easter. You know, and then when we had the joyous Easter, it was kind of joyous for the, for the disciples, but they still didn't get it. Even when the empty tomb, and, and it happened, I said, really big, right? God doesn't do anything in small ways. Earthquakes, lightning, thunder, angels, the stone was rolled. And the disciples didn't get it. In fact, even Thomas said he was mad, he missed it. If I can't see it, can't see him, I'm not going to believe it. Have we ever had that, like a little bit of a pity party? I missed out. I believe it when I see it. Maybe it's just me. Okay, now we go to that very morning now. Depending on the gospel you read, it said that Jesus and Matthew, Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother James. And he tells them, tell my disciples to go meet me in Galilee. Now before he died, before he was crucified, he told his disciples that what? He would die, he would resurrect on the third day, but to go meet him in Galilee. So here we are after the resurrection. Who went to Galilee? Zero. Now one person went to Galilee. They all stayed in the upper room in their hot mass of depression, <laughs> of sadness, of confusion. Even though Jesus had told them. Did you really look at the words in that prayer today in your book bulletin? It said, we're just like the disciples, aren't we? Sometimes we just don't get it. Even when it's plain, spelled out. Okay, so a perfect example, if you're a mom, or maybe even a dad, and you've ever been asked, where's the ketchup? And you say, in the refrigerator, on the right, behind the milk. I can't find it, I don't get it. I don't see it. Where's it at? In the refrigerator, on the right, behind the milk. I still don't see it. You get up, what? You go to the refrigerator, open up the door to the right, pull the milk out, and there's the ketchup. Right? It was there all along. Even though they didn't see it, they didn't get it. It's kind of where the disciples were at. Jesus said, me, me, Galilee. It's pretty explicit, right? Now, sort of, Galilee, as we said, was on the west side of the sea, Galilee. That's a pretty big area, but they knew where he meant. The very spot that Jesus met on the first time when they were fishing. But not one left Jerusalem. Now, as we said, Jesus didn't leave them there hanging and just waiting for somebody to show up. No, he met them right where they were at in that huddled mess up in the upper room. But then it says a week went by and he'd already seen them there and then he came back and led Thomas in. And then they waited a good week and Peter says, I'm tired. I'm tired of this. I'm going to go fishing. We well, can't go fishing in Jerusalem. <laughs> There's no water. So he had to leave Jerusalem, and several of the disciples said, I'm going with you. He was going back to doing what he had done before, fishing. That's what he knew how to do. That's probably how he could clear his mind and how he could think. So he gets out there, and they go fishing. And this is it's a small boat, because most of those fishing boats were small. And most of the fish are not that terribly far into the sea. It's not that far off of shore. They've been fishing all night long. And how much fish have they caught? Nothing. <laughs> Zero. Zilch. Now, I'm sure, as a fisherman, there's probably been those times where you don't catch anything. But there was a divine reason why they caught nothing. Because Jesus, at daybreak, is on the side of the shore with his coals hot, cooking a fire, cooking breakfast. So there was fish on it, there was bread on it, and he yells out to them so they weren't that far away. He hollers out to them, he says, children, have you any food? And what did they say? No. And he says, cast your net on the right side. Now, if you were a fish, do you know which side of the boat to stay on and not be caught? Especially if they're throwing nets in and there's a current? No. 
But this time, when they threw the net over, it says what? It was just replay. The whole boat goes. There's so many fish, they can't really even put them all in the boat, and the boat's sinking again. Now, hello. Yeah, what a thought that they would have said then. <gasps> it's Jesus. But they didn't. It wasn't until all the fish were caught that one disciple said, It's the Lord! And it was not Peter. It was John. And then when Peter hears John say that, his brain engages and he goes, It's the Lord! And he jumps into that water. It's this now, he wasn't completely naked, but they take off their outer garment and stuff because it's easier to fish. So he puts it on and he jumps into the water. Now, this time of year, that water is cold. <laughs> it is very, very, very cold. Like, take your breath away cold. I was baptized over there at this time of year. I have never been in such cold water in my life. When I went down and I came up, it sucked the air out of me like I'd had the wind knocked out. I couldn't catch my breath for minutes afterwards. It was the cold. And he's swimming ashore. Now, he didn't have that far to go, but think about it. He's got on now his clothes, his outer garment that's going to be wet and heavy. But he doesn't care. He gets to the edge. Jesus has already got fish on the fire, already warm, already got bread. I'm sure he was hungry. But then what does Jesus say to him? He says, bring me some of the fish that you just caught. Now, one we're going, why? You got a fire going right there with fish on it. Because up to this point, Jesus had been feeding them. And now he's getting ready to make the shift, the transition. Bring me the fish that you caught. Now, did they put the fish in that net? No, God did but they had to be a willing participant. So they bring the fish. And don't you love it, how exact they are? Not only were these massive fish, but they said there was 153. <laughs> exact. And it's at this time, as they're eating breakfast, and I'm sure I can imagine what's going through Peter's head, that Jesus gives Peter that opportunity to say not once, but three times. Those magical words. Three times to say three magical words. I love you. Now, did Jesus need to hear it? Did Jesus know that Peter didn't love him? No. He knew what was in Peter's heart. He did it three times for three times of redemption that Peter denied that he knew Jesus. That was what was weighing on his heart. Jesus knew that that's what he needed to finally be free from the bonds and the chains that he put around himself. I love the story because while most of us focus on that whole part with Peter, we miss sight of that first part of the story where Jesus gave a simple command before he died and after he rose of meet me in Galilee. And yet not one person went until a week later just because Peter decided he was going fishing. He doesn't say, you know what? Maybe Jesus is in Galilee. <laughs> but where did Jesus meet him? Right where he told him. It was the bookend. He met Peter, James, John, Andrew in that spot when they had caught nothing. And he filled their nets. At the end of his ministry, he meets them in the exact same spot when they had caught nothing. And he fills their nets. He's telling them, it's not up to you to produce the fish. Just be willing to cast your nets. Be willing to go where I tell you to go. Be willing to do what I tell you to do. And leave the rest up to me. I don't know what's going on in your life right now. Maybe you're dealing with something that you're not feeling very loved. Maybe, maybe things are not working out the way you thought. Maybe 
Maybe emotions are running high, maybe you don't know what more to do, but to go back to a past life. Jesus is there waiting to intervene and to stop you right there. He's there to fill your nets and to tell you how much he loves you because he already knows how much you love him. Gracious and loving Father, thank you for not leaving us as that huddled mess, full of uncertainty and emotions and turmoil up in the upper room. Thank you for gently waiting, continually calling us to meet you. For each of us, Galilee is different. But thank you for reminding us that while maybe we're struggling trying to do it on our own, maybe we're trying to make things happen or, or produce stuff for you, that that's not what you have called us to do. You've called us to just be willing to drop our nets when and where you call us, and ultimately to leave the rest up to you. It's not our job to sort them out. That's yours. You just call us to love them, to be excited about what we know, and to share that excitement, to share the miracles that you have done in our life. To share the experiences and the journey that we have taken on our life with you. And leave the rest in your hands. Thank you for reminding us of this. And thank you for reminding us that no matter where that journey has taken us, no matter what we've ever done or what we probably will do, that you still love us and you still offer us redemption at every turn. Thank you for these gifts. Thank you for your saving love. 
and thank you on those times when we have no words to even express. You have given us your prayer and taught us your words that we can pray anytime, anywhere. If you would join with me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. 